One thing I've learned, God responds to um, hunger and thirst for him. Scripture says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. God responds to that, just like a parent would respond to a child eager and desirous to be with them. And the older your children get, the more you appreciate <laughs> the times that they want to be with you. You don't often when they're little, you know, because it can be overwhelming. But as your kids get older and they probably desire less and less to be with you, you appreciate that so much. And you find it, um, it warms your heart. And so it warms the heart of God when we delight and are eager to be with him. So let's um, pray. You can repeat after me, Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King. Give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to perceive, and the will to obey your word that I hear today in Yeshua's name. Amen. So we're here on Shabbat. Already a win, right? It's a win-win. Shabbat, right? We, we don't have to work. We can rest from our labors. What a good day. And we're celebrating Shavuot, right? Uh, even better. And I'm sure that everyone here wants all that God has for us, right? You want everything that God has for you and for your life. I'm equally sure that we all want to see God move in the earth to accomplish his purposes, right? Um, why? Because it's part of our DNA as children of the living God. In order for this to happen, we must be on the same page as God. And since the promise of Yeshua is crystal clear, let's read it together. At one of these gatherings, he instructed them, the Talmudim, not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard about from me. For Yochanan used to immerse the people in water, but in a few days you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Yerushalayim and in all Yehuda and Shomron, indeed, to the ends of the earth. Every believer, you, me, young, old, must do their part in receiving the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. I can tell you, and I often reflect upon this, what separates People say this, they, there's debates about this. People often don't understand why there's so many different religions in the earth and what's the difference, right, if I believe in this religion or that religion or whatever. Well, the one thing that separates true faith in the true and living God is the power of God. <laughs> Simply put, we could say a lot of things. Remember the prophets of Baal. They were crying out to their gods for the whole day. They were jumping around. They were stirring themselves into a frenzy. They were cutting themselves. But when they called it out to their god, there was no response. Why? Because their god isn't God. Their God had no power. Their God couldn't help. What separates us as children of the living God is the very fact that he's alive. That he hears the cries of his people and that he responds to us. He speaks to us. He moves in our life. Wow. <laughs> That's all I could say. And so the difference is in the power. You've heard the expression, the proof is in the pudding, right? The difference is in the power. We serve the living God. And I know that you're probably in here this morning, and you have things going on in your life. I want to encourage you. You serve the living God, who has the power to deliver you, has the power to move on your behalf. And you know what? Often, I believe, he allows circumstances okay because he wants to show us that he is indeed powerful to save but every believer must do their part in receiving say receiving 
the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. And please hear me correctly. I said every believer must do their part, not God's part. I want to put you at ease. We can't do God's part. I can't, you know, you can come up here for prayer later. I can't give you the Ruach HaKodesh. That's God's part. And we just need to simply put ourselves in the position for God to move. Be ready to receive. Be eager to encounter God. And God does his part. You see, this promise of power doesn't just happen. It requires earnest, heartfelt desire. Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want him? Do you want for God to pour out his spirit? I'll tell you a quick story. When I was a new believer, I don't know, maybe four or five, six months old in the Lord, and, you know, just hungry for the word of God. I spent my, you know, uh, evenings just studying the word of God and reading the scripture and listening to, uh, back then, if you can believe it, tapes. <laughs> Not eight track tapes, though. <laughs> but listening to cassette tapes of different people teaching the word of God with my Bible and going through scriptures. And I, I saw in the scripture that God promised to pour out the Ruach HaKodesh upon his people. And friends, as soon as I saw that promise, I did not stop seeking God until it happened to me. And I remember the spiritual leader that I went to, it was, it was, that didn't happen, it happened on a Wednesday night. I didn't know he was going to be teaching on that, he was teaching on that, and he said, come up, and if you, and I came up, and I stood, similar, very similar to here, up there, and he came by, and he prayed over me, and I felt something. And he moved on in the service, moved on. And I believed, God, I know you did something in my heart. But I continued to seek him over the course of the next few days. And God began to just deepen and deepen that work in my heart and in my life. Because I was eager to have every gift that God said I could have. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. doesn't just say everyone will be filled, does it? Those who hunger and thirst for all that God has to offer will be filled. And I want to encourage you today. Because you know what? This is what happens. I know it's true. I will, God's people are great people. But we live in a fallen world. And let me tell you what happens. God gets a hold of us in a very powerful way, and we're excited about God. But here's the truth. We are, this, this gift of God in us, right, is in an earthen vessel. And we take these earthen vessels, and we go and rub shoulders with the world all week long. And rubbing shoulders with the world all week long, it kind of buffets the glory of heaven living in our hearts. And we get kind of like worn down and we kind of get accustomed to the way the world does business and the way the world is dull to spiritual things. And we kind of take that out. And that's why it's important to be in community because we have to come away back to the community of faith and say, wait, wait, God reorientates us. And says, no, we don't have to live dull to spiritual things. No, we could be alive to the Spirit of God. And so when we do that, our hearts become, that's why when we come on Shabbat or we gather as a group of believers, it, something stirs in us. And that's something that we need to cherish and something that we need to make sure isn't extinguished. That's our part. God does the work, but our part is, listen, we know, we all know it. As we're going and rubbing shoulders with the world, all of a sudden, things you wouldn't do before, maybe three months ago, all of a sudden, you're entertaining. And you realize.
realize something's a little off. Gee, what happened to that fervor, that fire, that passion for the things of God? It seems to have dulled. Yeah, it dulled. Because we are in earthen vessels and we're rubbing shoulders with the world. And we could get lured into the way they do things. And so we have to do our part to be diligent and earnest to keep our spiritual life fresh and on fire for God. Amen? Amen. I wasn't even in my notes. I don't know where that came from. But take it as from the Spirit of God. I want to say this, that I'm going to try not to speak long because I want to get to a time in ministry where you can receive. You listen, friends, God loves you so much. God wants you to have everything that he has for you. That's, that's it. And if I could take it from heaven and just put it into your spirit, boy, I'd do it. I would stay here all day until everyone got everything God had for them, if I could do it. But the only one that could do it for you is you. And it does take a little bit of tenacity to go after God, to seek his face diligently. Every believer must do their part. This empowerment that I'm talking about is not an option because this is our option. Either we're going to, you know, we sang that song to live and to walk this world in white. You can't walk this world in white. In other words, a holy life without the power of the Spirit of God. You will fail, you will fall, you will stumble. You can't do it. And so the Ruach HaKodesh empowers us. And when we start to wane a little bit, he taps us on the shoulder and says, you need to get back to the things you did before, my friend. You need to get back to times of prayer and times of fasting and times of the Word and times of worship. Get back. And we heed that voice, and then we feel that fervor and that zeal and that passion come into us again. We can't do it on our own. And it's not optional. We need him. Spurgeon, one of the greatest men of God in the history of the modern Kehillah said this. He said, without the Ruach HaKodesh, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like holes without fire, we are useless. That's profound. <laughs> We're useless without the Spirit of God. So what does that tell me? Well, I want to be useful, right? That I can't do it. And can, I, can I tell you, another thing we have become used to, and not to be in judgment, seriously, but I'm seeing these things in these things I'm reading, but the body of Messiah in general has become accustomed to operating according to natural gifts and talents. Which, by the way, God gives. But we can't do it without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what changes lives. So, the Bible says, you will receive power. You will receive power. Where's your power meter at? If you were a car, we could test your horsepower. <laughs> we could put you on a little machine and rev the engine, and we could see how much horsepower you have. Let me ask you a question. How's your power level? in the Spirit of God. Answer that, because there's like a little knowing meter in our hearts that we know, kind of, where we're at. So that's a good little indicator. Where is your power out? And here's the good news. If you've received the infilling of the Ruach, and things have kind of like leveled off, and perhaps 
you know, not as, as zealous as before, we can come up for a fresh touch of God's Spirit. We've never received the Spirit of God. Hey, and by the way, it's no shame to come for more of God's Spirit. Like there's something wrong with us. No, God put this treasure in earthen vessels. He knows that. He knows we have a tendency to leak out the Spirit of God. He knows we have a tendency to wane. And so he calls us to come and to be refilled. Do you think there's a reason why Shavuot is a Moedim? Is it a pointed time for us? Yeah, because he wants this day on our calendar to come and to be refilled and refreshed by the power of his spirit, by the power of his word. And he says in this that you will receive power, right? And you will be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Yehuda and Shomron and indeed to the ends of the earth. In order for us to receive the Ruach HaKodesh for the purpose of reaching the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the nations of the earth, we must first receive the Ruach HaKodesh or a fresh touch of his power in our lives. And to do this, we must believe before we receive. Hear that? We must believe. See before. Oh, we live in, the, we, I hate to say it, I'm going to have to call out my wife's home state of Missouri. And I'm only the one in the house that pronounces it correctly, by the way. They say Missouri. But the old time people in Missouri say Missouri, okay, which is the show me state, right? They want to see it. You show me before I believe it. The Word of God and the Kingdom of God operates differently. We believe it before we see it. People often have reservations as to the validity of the experience of the infilling of the Ruach. And this will almost surely prevent that individual from receiving. Because we will be like a ship tossed to and fro. Yes, it's of God. No, it's not of God. Yes, I need it. No, I don't need it. No, you have to be fully convinced in your heart. I was fully convinced once I read it that I needed it. I was fully convinced once I read it that I could have it. And I approached it that way until I received. We all need to do the same. If a person is not convinced that the gift that Yeshua promised is real and is for them personally, they will never sincerely and eagerly pursue and realize the great promise. Right? I mean, if you don't really think it's for you, how are you going to really go after that? Like if someone says in your, in your work, hey, you know what, um, Chris, if you do such and such, you're going to be the boss next year. Well, you hear that and you say, well, hmm, I don't really think that's true. I don't really think that's true. They're not going to make me the boss. That's just a ploy to get me to work harder. But, so, so what are you going to do? Chris is not really going to give that extra mile. But if someone calls you into the office and Chris, I'm not joking. If we see a good performance out of you, there's a potential that you could be the boss next year. Chris is going to leave the office and say, you know what? I believe them. And I'm going to hunker down. I'm going to do my diligence. I'm going to work a little harder and I'm going to get it done. It's going to be a totally different mindset. She was convinced that what the person promised was true. Friend, it's the same with the Ruach. If we are not convinced that this promise of power is real and for us, we're going to half-heartedly go after it, and friend, you will not receive. That's not how God works. Wholehearted devotion is what God looks for. And you can't fool God. <laughs> God, I wholeheartedly we sing songs. God, I surrender all. And in your heart, you see most, <laughs> you know, so go get carried away, God, you know. God, I surrender all except 
futile ditties here. God, I surrender all. Well, Abraham, what about your son? You surrender him? Maybe not him. <laughs> Abraham said, yeah, him too. And we wonder why we read about them. We read about them is because they did surrender all. They were wholly devoted. They were all in. Friend, God's no respecter of person. When we're all in, <laughs> he's all in with us. And so I want to encourage you today. This is the great news. We can all get everything God has for us. Everything. Because God, is he's not telling lies in heaven, friend. He's the foundation of his throne is truth and justice. See, Hasatan, don't you hate him? There's the only person you could hate, the only being you could hate, right? Hasatan uses doubt to prevent many well-meaning believers from receiving the Ruach HaKodesh. Hasatan will shoot fiery arrows of doubt and unbelief, but it is up to the individual person to reject those. How do we reject those? Those fiery darts are extinguished by our faith. That's like, you, you, I'm going to tell you this. So you walk up to one of my kids and say, you know what? Your father is a scoundrel. Do it. I'm 100% confident they're not going to buy what you're selling. You tell them that. Your father. I know they're not going to, they're not going to buy into that. They don't believe it. Want to know why? Because they've experienced their father. You can say whatever you want. They're not going to buy it. Same is true for us. When we experience God, when we understand who he is, Hasatan could say, well, that gift isn't for you. That's, that's a joke. Because the Bible says every gift is for me. Everyone. Everyone, he wants me to have it. He wants you to have it in you. To have not just most of them, not just the majority, all of them. Because he's a good God. He's my heavenly father. And he promised it to me. So we have to reject that nonsense that comes from Hasatan and every fiery lie. Oh, by the way, this just came into my spirit. So, well, you're not worthy. Because, you know, let's face it, um, <laughs> we're not perfect. So, so you're disqualified because that thought you thunk or that deed you did or the way you treated this one or that one. Friend, if it was based on our performance, we'd all be in a world of hurt. It's based on his performance. And by receiving the Ruach HaKodesh, we are better equipped to live a godly life and a goodly life. So no, you're not disqualified. You're a great candidate for God. Yeshua said this, Ask, if you ask me for something in my name, what does it say? But, but don't you want to first know what it is? <laughs> you ask for something in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, you will keep my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforting counselor like me, the spirit of truth to be with you forever. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he is staying with you and will be united with you. Future tense will be united with you. You see, the very fact that the Talmudim waited as they were instructed tells us that they believed that they would be empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh. He said, wait in Yerushalayim. They waited in Yerushalayim. And perhaps the very fact that we don't <laughs> do some of the things the scripture tells us to do is an indication that maybe we don't believe like we ought to. Which again, no condemnation, that's okay. But maybe we need to rethink that. Maybe we 
we don't do some things. Maybe we don't pray as much as we should because we don't really think prayer works. Well, I want to tell you, prayer does work. But I'll tell you another thing about prayer. It is work. Oh, it's an effort to go to God in prayer, right? Because your flesh don't want you to go. Hasatan wants to oppose everything you should talk to God about. Guess what? It's work to pray. But prayer works. The enemy is a master at sowing doubt and unbelief into the minds and hearts of believers. Just like he did with... Adam and Eve in the garden, he does it with us today. If he can get us to walk away from God and his kingdom, the next best thing, if he can't get us to do that, well, I'm not going to walk away from God, I'm going to hang in there, God. And if, he, and if it's a lot of believers, he realized that that's an overreach. So if he can't get you to do that, the next best thing he could do is get us to doubt God's promises. So that's when we read the word. Well, I believe 95% of it. By the way, you know, we talk about the founders being believers, and some of them were. But some of them were believers in a, in a, in a different type of way. Did you, I mean, you ever hear of the Thomas Jefferson Bible? You know what the problem with the time of Thomas Jefferson Bible is? He removed, because he was a, a deist, he removed all this supernatural acts of God out of the Bible. Because he didn't believe in a super, an eminent God, a God who is here working and moving in our midst. He believed in a God like a clockmaker. He made the world, wound it up, and... Let it go in all its natural ways. But yet we read in the Bible, right, that God is constantly intervening, moving, changing, stepping in, rescuing, causing the dead boy to be raised, causing the sun to stop still, causing the uh, river to split in two, causing the ox head to float. Causing a chariot of heaven to come down and pick up the prophet instead of Uber, he sent a chariot. Those are all supernatural, fantastical things. I knew you were waiting for that word, I could give it to you. Unbelievable, but true. Unbelievable. That's the God you serve, he's unbelievable. But it's real. So, hey, this is why... How do you not love God? Whatever pickle you're in, God can get you out. When you go back, think of the prodigal son. Know what he said to God? He said to his father, up yours. Not interested in you. Just give me your money. <laughs> wow, it's harsh. Just give me the cash and up yours. Yikes. And that story is a picture of God. And we do that to God. And yet, when we're in the lowest low, in the biggest pickle of our lives, we can look to that same God that we spit in his face and say, Dad, I want to come home. And he doesn't say, oh, 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 oh you want to come home now? Oh, man, it's going to be fun. He says, come on. Come on. Ready, it's waiting for you, son. Come on in. I missed you. That's a pretty good God, huh? So whatever you think of God, or think you know of God, if you don't think that about God, that's the wrong God. Sometimes, well, let me tell you this. Boy, I, I really got to wind this up. I'm only on our first point, but that's okay. Just let me tell you a couple of things that I want to tell you.
What happened to Adam and Eve in that garden, right? They were living a life of ease, weren't they? They were in the most beautiful place on earth. They were, you know, how do they say, footloose and fancy free. Buzzing around the garden, naming animals. God himself would walk with them in the cool of the day. That's, an, that's a pretty good gig, right? But then the enemy comes in and he gets them to disobey God. And they went from a life of ease to a life of toil and hardship all their days. And that life of toil and hardship was visited upon us because Adam set the tone for humankind, except for when God intervened and the Mashiach stepped out of eternity and into time and he said, hey, hey, friends, take my yoke upon you. For my burden is easy, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Restoration of what took place in the garden that Yeshua said he can now reverse. You can go to a life of ease as you rest in me as you live in the spirit and not according to the flesh. Most of our trouble, friends, comes because we try to live a spiritual life in the flesh. And you can't. And when you try to live what was meant to be lived in the spirit, in the flesh, you will be frustrated all your days. We have to live in the Spirit, but to live in the Spirit, we must embrace the Spirit. So let me tell you the three things that you need to do, and we're going to pray. You don't need to hear any more of what I said. That's basically, you listen, you guys get what I'm telling you, right? We need the Ruach HaKodesh. And I'm not going to tell you how you need to do that except you need to earnestly seek him. And we want to spend some time here today. We're going to have some people come forward and be prepared to pray with you, okay? And for you, though, to, in your heart of hearts, say, yes, God. Yes, Ruach Hashem, come and fill me and flood me with more of you. And three things that need to happen is one, like I said, we have to believe. Before we receive two, we need to expect to receive the Ruach HaKodesh. See, a woman might suspect she's pregnant, but until she sees the test come in positive, then she becomes an expectant mom. She may suspect she's pregnant, but she's not expecting until she gets the confirmation, right? And when she gets that confirmation, she builds a nursery long before it happens. Nine months of expecting this awesome package to come into their lives, right? That expectancy produces them, the family, mom, to do something, to prepare. And then lastly, an expectancy is a state of mind, by the way. We need to be ready to receive. And I'm going to give you, you can read the passage on your own, but the Talmudim in Acts 1, they did several things. They prayed. So when we call you forward, friend, like I said, I don't have anything to give you. I will pray with you. The others will pray with you. I have nothing to give you. I can't give you what only God could give you. But God can give it, and God does give it, and God will give it. They prayed, and you could come up and pray, and you could be prayed for. They studied the Word of God with prophetic understanding. Friend, not with natural understanding. And when I say understanding, I don't mean you, you went on the internet and Googled, and Joe so-and-so said this about the Word. Prophetic understanding. The Spirit of God taught those Talmudim, the Scriptures, and Yeshua taught them prophetically. And we need to have that prophetic mindset as well. And it's next, they waited. Here's the, wait for the word, ready? Wait for it. They waited until. 
Oh man, we're Americans. <laughs> I can't wait until. What's wrong with you? Jack in the box? I can't be waiting all day on my hamburger. I mean, wait until. What kind of, we, won't, we won't go to that drive-in. No, right? We're not going to that drive-thru. Pull up to the thing that says, wait for your food until we check out. <laughs> But do you, I want to tell you, you, we think that's normal and right. Go to Africa. They leave for service on Thursday. And they stay at service all day. For two hours. If, you went to, if we went to Africa and said, we can do messianic service for you. They come. But if after two hours we said we're finished, see you later, they'd say, what? We'll see you later. But wasn't that the warm-up? They're ready to stay and worship and seek God's face when? Until. <laughs> Until. We need that. That's why we and Rabbi Carol, we're going to pray in a second. Me and Rabbi Carol often have this little tension because on the holidays we want to have food and do nice things as a community, which we love to do. But I love it and I hate it in the same way because... Yeah, I want to have fellowship, but before that, I don't want that to distract us from what God wants to do spiritually here and now. That's more important. Friend, I looked in the mirror this morning. You know what it told me? You could wait on lunch. <laughs> you ain't, you ain't, you ain't going to drop from that mountain attrition. You could wait. And I said, got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's got to be the first thing. So let's seek God until, and I'm not saying, yeah, listen, maybe you hear an hour, maybe you hear five minutes, and God touches your life. Beautiful. I'm, there's no time limit. There's no legalistic thing on it. But get what you need from God, that's what I'm saying. Get what you need from God. But friend, <laughs> all this I'm going to tell you as well, it's on you. Get what you need from God, but it's on you. The day I received the Ruach HaKodesh, I didn't say, I didn't put it on the man of God who prayed for me. I just saw him as, that was part of God's delivery system. It was between me and God. And for the next few days, it was between me and God, and it was me and God, and it was me and God, and it was me and God, until me and God worked it out. It was between me and God. They waited until, and friend, the last thing they did is they praised God. It says, and they spent all their time. Oh my gosh. I have to read that again. I can't believe it, but it says it. And they spent all their time in the temple courts praising God. You see, when God, the real God, touches you, You don't get that out of your system, my friend. <laughs> you don't get that out of your system. When he touches you, you're touched. And even when you have a bad day, you can't shake it. You can't shake it. Oh, I'm having a bad day in my mind, but in my spirit. God, I don't feel like praising you today, but in my spirit, I can't stop from praising you. I can't stop. My mind wants to shut it down. My emotions want to leave, but my heart says, no way. I'm going to worship God.
Evan's going to put on a CD. D.L. Moody in one meeting, he held up an empty glass and he asked the audience, how do I get the air out of the glass? Someone raised their hand and says, suck it out with a vacuum. He said it would be, suck it, suck out the air. He said it would create a vacuum and the glass would break. And then Moody just took a pitcher of water and filled the glass up. How do we get those things out of us that have been hampering us and hindering us all our life? And just pull it out. But you can get filled with the Holy Spirit of heaven. When you're filled with him, all the junk goes. This gets washed out. Holy Spirit, come. I want to ask the people I asked earlier to come and pray to come and just come up here. And I want us to spend a little time. Welcome in this place. Sure. And if you if you would say to me today, Rabbi, I got all I need. I don't need God at all any more than I can take any more of God. I'm just filled to overflowing with all that God is. To you, I would say, stay where you're at. But if you're saying to me, Rabbi, I need more of God. My family needs more of God. I need God to move. I need that emptiness inside to go. God, I need the excitement and passion that I once had for heaven back in my life. Spirit of God, I need, maybe you never experienced the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh with evidence of speaking it to come up. If you need God, if you want God, if you want more of God, if you want to seek God, if you need a fresh touch of God, I want to ask you to do something by coming forward and start seeking God. If you want prayer specifically, folks are here, we're going to be up here praying. And if you say, if you come up to Gary and say, Gary, I want to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we'll pray for you. If you just want more of the Spirit of God, So this is what we're asking you to do. So come, just come forward and just fill in. Don't start a line. Just come and begin to pray to the Lord. Come get prayer if you need prayer, whatever it is. We, friend, the world it needs us. That's what I'm going to say. That's how I look at it. The world needs us to have more of God. <laughs> The world needs the body of Messiah to be what the body of Messiah reads like in the Word of God. So come forward. Just come and fill in the front, guys. Come. Uh, uh, Wayne, help everyone find a spot. There's ample room. Help people come in and funnel in. Help them funnel in. Come on in, plenty of room. Just come in, funnel to your, my right, to my left. Find a little, you need just a little patch of rug you can stand and pray in. Do that. Find a little patch of rug. And if you want prayer and someone is praying for someone, when that person steps away, just come up and receive prayer. So just seek the Lord. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. What does that tell me? That's in the whole theme of Moedim. God has seasons, appointed seasons. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Well, God, I want to find you on Tuesday. But God says, no, Monday's the day. <laughs> we got to go with what God says, right? So seek the Lord. Talk to God.
Yes, Lord.